Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and, and welcome. Um, my name is Amanda Woodward, and I am the Dean of the Division of Social Sciences here at the University of Chicago. Um, and I'm just delighted to be here with this group of faculty um, for this event. Um, this evening is continuing um, a year-long series of events at the University of Chicago commemorating the 75th anniversary of the uh, first controlled self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. It happened just over there. Um, and over the past five months, there have been events across campus um, commemorating the breakthrough um, ex um, and exploring the experiment's long-term impact. And the events have um, presented opportunities to engage scientists, and artists, um, policymakers and the public around the set of issues that grow from that um, original event 75 years ago. Um, now this evening's discussion, I'm uh, particularly delighted because it brings social science into the conversation in just the way that it should be. Um, our panelists will be introduced in just a moment. Um, each is a, a, a scholar in international relations and national security, and they'll offer different viewpoints on military decision, the role of nuclear arms in the formation of alliances, and aids and obstacles to nonproliferation efforts. Now, this event is sponsored by my division, the Division of Social Sciences at the uh, University of Chicago. It's um, also sponsored by the Center for International Social Science Research, um, the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, and the Chicago Project on Security and Threats. And I want to thank each of those organizations for their support. Now, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Steve Edwards, um, and Steve will introduce the panelists um, when he comes up. Now, Steve is currently Vice President and Chief Content Officer at WBEZ. Um, he is, as you all know, an award-winning journalist, producer, and program host. Um, he's covered everything from politics to pop culture in his work. Um, his work has appeared in BBC, Bloomberg News, PBS, and numerous public radio stations. Um, from 2012 to 2017, um, Steve was the executive director at the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. And in that role, he oversaw all programming and operational duties, including um, its acclaimed public event series, professional fellowships, career and civic engagement programs, and um, one of my favorites, the Axe Files uh, podcast in partnership with former presidential advisor David Axelrod. Um, so, um, Edwards is definitely a University of Chicago intellect, um, but he's not a University of Chicago alum. Um, he got his uh, bachelor's degree in political science from Amherst College, and he was a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan. So please join me in welcoming Steve Edwards. Thank you. Dean Woodward, thank you so much for that introduction. It is an honor to be back here at the university with all of you at such an important time for this conversation, not only because of the history uh, that we're commemorating over the course of this year, thinking about 75 years after the dawn of the nuclear age began right here, just steps from where we are, but also the present realities in our geopolitics today. And I think many of us uh, watched very closely the announcement just a few days ago last week when our sister publication here at the university, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, uh, move the hands 30 seconds closer, two minutes to midnight now, the closest they've been in more than 60 years. So uh, I'm eager to hear the insights that our panelists have on the, the fundamental question before us tonight, a safer or more dangerous world, nuclear weapons in today's global community. And we do have a distinguished panel. I'll begin on my far right, your left, by introducing them each in order. And then what we will do is we will have each of them talk for about five minutes. Uh, that will bring insights into this question from their research. We will then move to questions among us and then your questions for each of them as we go forth. So let me begin uh, with Bob. Robert Pape is a professor of political science at the University of Chicago, specializing in international security affairs. His publications include Cutting the Fuse, the Explosion of Global Suicide Terrorism and How to Stop It, Dying to Win, The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism, Bombing to Win, Air Power and Coercion in War, Why Economic Sanctions Do Not Work, The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism, and many, many other articles. He's a frequent contributor and analyst to a variety of news and media outlets. He taught at Dartmouth College before coming to the University of Chicago, and he taught air power strategy for the USAF School of Advanced Air Power Studies for three years. He received his PhD 
from the University of Chicago and graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Pittsburgh. He is also the director of the Chicago Project on Security and Threats as his current work focuses on the causes of suicide, terrorism, and the politics of unipolarity. Next to Robert Pape is Paul Post, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Chicago and a research affiliate of the Pearson Institute for the Study of Global Conflicts. He studies international relations with a focus on international security. He is the author of two books, The Economics of War and Organizing Democracy. He's authored or co-authored academic papers in numerous journals and has been featured in various news outlets as well. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan, a Master's of Science from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a BA from Miami University. And before coming to the University of Chicago, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Rutgers and taught in the Department of Economics at The Ohio State University. Next to Professor Post is Austin Carson, who is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Chicago, where he currently specializes in security and intelligence and their relationship to international relations theory, international security, and global governance. At the core of his projects is an interest in understanding how governments selectively reveal and conceal what they do and the disjuncture this creates between the front stage, quote, and the backstage, quote, of international politics. His forthcoming book analyzes covert forms of military intervention and their role in states' pursuit of limited war. Other work assesses the politics of open secrets, the impact of publicity on international rules, sensitive information in international organizations, and theories of limited war, all of which will be in play here tonight. He graduated with a PhD in political science from The Ohio State University and has research fellowships at the Niehaus Center for Globalization and Governance at Princeton, the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies at George Washington University, and the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Next to Professor Carson is Paul Staniland, who's an associate professor of political science and faculty chair of the Committee on International Relations. He co-directs the program on international security policy and program on political violence. His research focuses on political violence and international security, particularly, as many of you know, in South Asia. His book, Networks of Rebellion, Explaining Insurgent Cohesion and Collapse, won several awards, and he has published widely in academic and policy journals. And finally, next to Professor Staniland is Paige Price Cohn, who is the Nuclear Pro Proliferation Fellow for the Chicago Project on Security and Threats here at the university. She recently received her PhD in political science from the University of South Carolina. Her research and teaching interests lie at the intersection of international relations and comparative politics. She's broadly interested in how institutions affect the foreign policies of leaders, and more specifically in how they affect a leader's propensity for nuclear proliferation. She also explores the conditions under which leaders may choose to reverse their weapons programs, another timely insight, and is willing, and currently is working on a book, and as some of you may know, most recently was named one of the seven freshest perspectives <laughs> on nuclear policy in 2017 by the Bulletin for the Atomic Scientists. So please welcome all of our panelists here tonight. Great to have you with us. All right, we are going to start on the far end with Professor Pape. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, and, and thank you, Dean Woodward. Um, it is especially fitting to have our IR faculty, especially our young IR faculty, commenting on the effects of nuclear weapons here at the University of Chicago, and I'm delighted to be part of it. Nuclear weapons inspire tremendous fear, not just among experts, but widely in the public at large, and for good reason. When researching why Japan surrendered, I had to wade through gory details of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where two atomic bombs killed over 100,000 people in less than one minute. Today's nuclear weapons are even more destructive. No wonder the thought of nuclear attack evokes fear. Paradoxically, however, nuclear weapons are also a powerful force for peace. The century before the coming of nuclear weapons, from 1850 to 1945, was the classic era of great power politics, with numerous major wars among the great powers of the day. These wars were hugely destructive. In World War I, over 20 million people died. World War II was worse. Over 50 million people died. 
But since 1945, great power wars have come to a dead stop. The United States, China, Germany, Britain, France, the Soviet Union, now Russia, have had their troubles and have even waged proxy wars, but none of them have fought a shooting war against each other, a major one in over almost 75 years. Now what's the cause of this long great power peace? Is it the democratic peace? The idea that democracies don't fight each other? No, China and Russia are not mature democracies. Are international politics in general now so peaceful that major powers no longer have serious international crises with each other? No, from Berlin, Taiwan, and Cuba during the Cold War to Ukraine today, major powers have experienced numerous crises that one might think would escalate at least to sustain conventional combat between their militaries, but none have in 75 years. Now, although other factors matter, nuclear weapons have probably done more than any other to vastly lower the risk of great power war. The existence of nuclear weapons does not stop crises, but they serve as a powerful deterrent on the escalation of those crises. Why? The very fear that makes us anxious about nuclear weapons also serves as a break on the outbreak of major power war. This fear is so great that even a whiff of nuclear gunpowder often provokes tremendous pressures to de-escalate a crisis. Consider last summer. President Trump went through a series of tweets and other moves that essentially played a game of nuclear chicken with North Korea. The game of chicken, uh, you know this, it's famous from the movies, when two high school teenagers drive cars head on toward each other, daring each other to swerve. That's what President Trump did last summer, and that's why the fear of nuclear war has grown under the Trump administration. Now what's happened since? North Korea, China, South Korea, and even the United States have taken steps to change the game. Instead of bombing North Korea, we're now talking about North Korean athletes at the Winter Olympics in Seoul. In other words, as with numerous major power crises since 1945, a crisis among nuclear-armed adversaries is generating tremendous pressure to dampen risks rather than escalate them. Now, so does this mean all this worry has been for nothing and that the peaceful effects of nuclear weapons are so strong we should all just go home? <laughs> um, uh, alas, no. Uh, the true danger uh, related to nuclear weapons is strategic miscalculation, especially in a crisis. That is, that in the early stages of a crisis, individual political leaders will overplay their hands, bomb facilities with conventional weapons, oblivious to the possibilities of accidental or inadvertent nuclear escalation. This is where an informed public debate like tonight is important, to call attention to alternative pathways to resolve tensions. Today, no need is greater than with North Korea. It is imperative to end the game of nuclear chicken, not just for a few months, but in a lasting way. Our goal should be to use the next months surrounding the, uh, the Winter Olympics to stop playing the game of chicken and to de-escalate on both sides. The best way to do that is to say, okay, you say we're a threat, but we're going to de-escalate if you de-escalate. We should be heading toward a straightforward deal. We should de-escalate the military exercises that the United States and South Korea have been conducting annually every year for years to practice conquering every inch of North Korea in exchange for North Korea de-escalating nuclear and missile tests. Starting at the Olympics, Let's put this deal squarely on the table and truly change the game of nuclear chicken into a game of mutual de-escalation and use the fear of nuclear weapons as a force for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pape. We'll now turn to Paul Post. Great. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dean Woodward. Thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. Um,
This is obviously a very important topic, and I'm excited to be up here with such a great panel of my colleagues. So there's two constants in international politics since 1949. First one is the presence of nuclear weapons, and really that started before 1949. <laughs> the second is the presence of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. And as it so happens, these two things are intimately tied together. As NATO's first Secretary General, Lord um, Ishmay, famously remarked, to keep the purpose of NATO is to keep the Americans in, to keep the Russians out, and to keep the Germans down. Well, when it comes to the role of nuclear weapons in NATO, that same three-part formula applies, that it's about keeping American nukes deployed, keeping Russian nukes deterred, and keeping German nukes denied. <laughs> With respect to keeping American nukes deployed, this has been at the center of NATO since the beginning. It's indeed why NATO is called, refers to itself as a nuclear alliance from the stationing of B-29 bombers in England during the late 1940s and 1950s, each of which was equipped with the bomb, to the forward deployment of nuclear forces, controlled American-controlled nuclear forces in Germany, Turkey, and even today, Belgium, Netherlands, other NATO allies, keeping American nuclear forces, American-controlled nuclear forces on the continent has been, again, foundational and fundamental to NATO's operation. That leads directly to the second purpose, keeping Russian nukes deterred. The idea is that by keeping American nukes deployed in Europe, it makes it that much less likely that Russia would want to tempt coercion, either by threatening a nuclear strike or even threatening with conventional strike. Because the reality is, if US nukes are safely stowed away in a silo in South Dakota, Russia might say, well, they're not really going to use them. They still have them. And so maybe we can coerce. But if they're on the front line, it creates a logic of use them or lose them. And the Russians, fearing that logic, would be more likely to be deterred. And then finally, when it comes to keeping German nukes denied, the reality is, is that was a condition for Germany to even enter NATO in the 1950s. They had to remain, they had to not possess their own nuclear weapons. Throughout the Cold War, that remained the issue and became even more important with the ending of the Cold War. In fact, in many ways, this is why NATO did not become less important with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, but became more important. In order for Germany to reunify, it had to make a commitment to not acquire nuclear weapons. And that was a commitment that was signed on to by the other major powers in Europe, the United States, England, France, and Russia. And the way to do that was to make sure that a unified Germany remained part of NATO. That mission was then expanded to the rest of Eastern Europe. The fear being that if these countries were left out on their own, they would seek to acquire nuclear weapons as a way of deterring a future threat, perhaps from a resurgent Russia. So by bringing them into NATO, in essence, it's offering the protection of the US nuclear umbrella as an incentive to not acquire nuclear weapons. And this actually ties to an idea that Dr. Price Cohn will be talking about in a little bit. So in short, NATO is a nuclear alliance. And in many ways, NATO exemplifies the role of nuclear weapons in the world over the past 60, 70 years. Nuclear weapons have been at the core of NATO's mission. Indeed, in the most recent NATO strategic document, they stated that as long as there's nuclear weapons in the world, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. I would take that one step further. I would say as long as there's nuclear weapons in the world, there will be a NATO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Post. And we now move to Austin Carson. All right, well, thanks to Dean Woodward. Thank you, Steve, to all my fellow panelists. Uh, really excited to be here today. And I'm struck by my colleagues, Bob and Paul. I, I feel like we should be handing nuclear weapons out at the entrance to the U.S. Security <laughs> Council or something. It's, it's, uh, it's a force for peace, including within alliances. So I'm going to give a slightly different perspective. I want to focus 
um, as much on the threat that nuclear weapons pose as uh, the sort of promise that they provide. Um, and nuclear weapons, fundamentally, it's a technology that, on the one hand, is an incredible innovation. Here at the University of Chicago, we have a site that's revered as sort of symbolic of human ingenuity in creating this incredible um, form of technology that helps both uh, civilian peaceful purposes and military purposes. But on the other hand, it raises critical questions, and it raised critical questions from day one about what do we do about this technology? How, how do we respond to the fact that the genie is, in a sense, out of the bottle? And do we have some buyer's remorse for developing a technology that is literally, in its current state, threatens the species, threatens the human race? Um, and my, fo my comments, I'm going to focus on how um, the United States and the world has managed nuclear technology. Um, and I want to focus on the global architecture that has been designed to control uh, nuclear technology, the nuclear nonproliferation regime. And it really, its, it's fundamental uh, core parts are twofold. One, the NPT, and two, the IAEA. The NPT is essentially a grand bargain. The Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, signed in 1967, divided the world into two. There were nuclear weapon states, and there were non-nuclear weapon states. And the grand bargain was that the nuclear weapon states, including the United States, were granted a monopoly on nuclear weapons. The most destructive, powerful weapon ever developed by the human race was allowed to be in the hands of a small number of countries. The second category of countries, non-nuclear weapon states, well, in return for forswearing the most powerful military technology ever created, they were given assistance in using that technology for civilian purposes, radiation, um, uh, medical applications, nuclear power, um, as well as a promise from those states that had nuclear weapons that they would eventually disarm. Um, and it's truly, to me, uh, it remains an incredible bargain that, uh, on the one hand, the most destructive technology was allowed to be in the hands of some states but not others. Uh, and in the eyes of some others, some critics of the regime, which Paul might mention, India being a, a, a very important one, a kind of nuclear apartheid. You can have it, but, but, but others can't. Um, in which the vast majority of the world said, OK, no, we won't, we won't <coughs> develop this technology. The second in core piece of the nonproliferation regime is the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's based in Vienna. It's an international organization. And it is designed, essentially, to put that bargain into action. On the one hand, it helps non-nuclear weapon states access nuclear technology for civilian purposes, use it for those purposes, and benefit. On the other hand, it keeps that nuclear weapon state monopoly in effect. It, uh, through its safeguard system, monitors the use of nuclear technology in those non-nuclear weapon states to make sure they're not secretly diverting it for military purposes. And a lot of my research has focused on what makes this effective and what makes it ineffective. So let me talk for a second about that. A key challenge in designing a global system to control nuclear technology and keep it, its military application in the hands of only a few countries is identifying these cases of covert or uh, hidden uh, military diversion. It's kind of a cat and mouse game, as you might imagine. And it turns out the IAEA is not the best cat. That is, it has not been given uh, very particularly powerful uh, resources and, and legal capabilities to find those facilities. So my research, uh, along with my co-author, Allison Carnegie at Columbia, has focused on an, uh, what we think is an untapped uh, source of insight, which is intelligence from governments. Um, for their own security purposes, countries like the United States spend billions of dollars over decades tracking all kinds of threats, but uh, in large part, nuclear proliferation trends. Some of our most sensitive sources and methods have to do with detecting undeclared hidden nuclear facilities and uh, nuclear uh, procurement networks. And this provides vastly more insight than the IAEA, an international organization hamstrung by resources and legal access problems, could ever hope to achieve. And so our research has looked at the conditions under which governments are willing to share this intelligence, given that they face a real dilemma. On the one hand, they might want to say, hey, look, North Korea has a nuclear site in which they're doing things they're not telling anyone about to develop potentially nuclear weapons. On the other hand, making that information public means it's a lot harder to gather that kind of intelligence two years, three years, five years down the road, because now we know how you figured it out. So what we found is that the International Atomic Energy Agency in the last 15, 20 years has developed routines for receiving that, some of those tips from national intelligence, including from the United States, acting on those tips, going and looking at that site and seeing what exactly is going on, while not advertising exactly who they got it from and how they got it. Um, so it serves as a kind of a solution to this dilemma of, of how can we share this kind of information without giving away the store in terms of intelligence collection. And it has really big implications for today. There's actually relatively regular news stories about um, the U.S. Uh, deciding to share or not share information with the IAEA about, say, Iranian alleged 
uh, noncompliance with uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the, the deal that it signed with the U.S. and other countries um, under the Obama administration. Um, the bad news that we found in our research is that this information, because it is so insightful and interesting, is also a source of power. If the United States doesn't want to facilitate the IEA scrutinizing a country's program, it just doesn't provide that information. And so what you get is a kind of selectivity, um, which on, when you're looking at it on the bright side, um, the glass is half full. Well, we know more than we would have without the IEA. But the glass is half, half empty in the sense that those countries that have the resources and intelligence to provide get to choose when to provide it and who to provide it about. So I think one of the bigger lessons that I want to bring to the table in our discussion today is in contrast to the physical sciences, where the emphasis uh, on the 75th anniversary is oftentimes on the innovation, the discovery, and the application of this new technology of, of a fission and fusion in the nuclear domain, I think the social sciences brings its own perspective on how technology has social and political implications. It's not pure science. That what we do and what we believe and what we agree to and what we create, institutions like the IAEA, they shape the distribution of that technology. They create social and political categories that help us understand, make sense, and manage that technology. And the political science perspective in particular, I think, is helpful because it injects a consideration of power. When you have information like intelligence, and that helps you identify the spread of that technology who has that information, what can they do with it, and when do they do that? Um, and hopefully that will help shed light on how we manage this technology that continues to vex us today. Professor Carson, thank you so much for those insights. And we now turn to Paul Staniland. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks to Steve. Thanks for, to Dean Woodward. Thanks to Paul Post for putting this together. So I'm going to come at this from a slightly different perspective. Uh, I study South Asia in particular. So I want to kind of get a handle on some of these questions of the military and political um, management of nuclear weapons and the consequences of nuclearization by looking at South Asia, especially since 1998, which is when um, basically dueling tests of nuclear weapons were performed by India and Pakistan. Uh, South Asia, India, and Pakistan exist in an environment of deep conventional military competition and since really the 1980s um, or even the 1970s, also nuclear competition. And so looking at the introduction of nuclear weapons into this environment, I think, can provide some interesting insights about the, the cross-cutting effects of new <coughs> technology of nuclear weapons. Um, rather than kind of three cheers for nuclear weapons or you know, zero cheers for nuclear weapons, uh, I want to talk about the trade-offs, the mixed results that occur once you get the introduction of a kind of particular form of mutually assured destruction, MAD for short, in the South Asian context. So what do I mean by mixed record? <clears throat> During the Cold War, scholars of nuclear weapons introduced the idea of an stability-instability paradox. And this is, I think, what has characterized South Asia since 1998. Stability, for all the reasons Professor Pape talked about. Essentially, if there is a nuclear war in South Asia, under most scenarios, there would be enormous loss of life. Basically, the destruction of these countries as functional kind of national entities. This induces extraordinary caution about the prospect of nuclear escalation or use. Right? There's a ceiling hopefully, assuming no miscalculation, beyond which conflict is, is very unlikely to go. Right? And policymakers are very well aware of the challenges that any kind of nuclear use or nuclear escalation would present. So that, that's good news. Right? The bad news is that at the same time, the stability at the strategic level has allowed for sustained instability below this kind of highest level of, of, of uh, interstate competition. So what we've seen in the last 20 years um, is the continuation of a pattern of proxy wars, terrorist attacks, and low-level skirmishes and conflict that introduce this kind of persistent element of instability that threatened to lead to unexpected, inadvertent escalations that could unsettle the stability at the higher level. So what does this mean? Though there are many scholarly arguments about this, I think it's reasonable to suggest that um, Pakistani support for various kinds of armed groups, insurgents, terrorists, et cetera, has continued despite India's acquisition of nuclear weapons. Why is this? India is deeply constrained in its options for responding to attacks like, for instance, the 2008 Mumbai attack or an attack on uh, the Indian parliament in December 2001. There's, again, as I said, a ceiling on what you can do without incurring unacceptable risks. So what this has led to is ongoing proxy war at this subconventional level um, that create this kind of grim and very bloody stability, punctuated by kind of sporadic but intense crises uh, after particularly provocative attacks. So on the one hand, this is potentially quite stable over time. Right? And from the Pakistani perspective, this is quite a good scenario. Right? 
um, continuing to engage in proxy war while being able to prevent the kinds of major conventional wars that struck South Asia, uh, most notably in 1965 and 1971, though as well in the Kashmir War in the late 1940s. In response, though, to this, the, the, this worry about being stuck in a stalemate, um, India has started to modernize its military and pursue options that would allow for military strikes that hopefully, in their hopes, not cross Pakistan's red lines, leading to nuclear escalation. So India is modernizing its forces, trying to come up with innovative ways to get around this nuclear stalemate. Right? And as India grows, its conventional strength is likely to continue to grow relative to Pakistan. Right? India is an enormous country, growing economy, investing heavily in defense. Uh, Pakistan, by contrast, is, is much, much smaller, substantially poorer, and kind of has to run much harder just to keep up. So what do we see now as challenges to the stability-instability dynamics that I argue characterize the subcontinent? Uh, India is trying to develop new options right, for limited strikes. Uh, it's been trying out some of these along the line of control in Kashmir over the last couple of years. Um, Narendra Modi's government pursued what were called surgical strikes against Pakistan army positions. Um, and the line of control that divides India and Pakistan in the disputed areas of Kashmir has seen a massive escalation in skirmishes, artillery shelling, and raids back and forth. Right? There's supposedly a ceasefire that's been in place since 2003. But India is trying to put pressure on Pakistan in a way that won't trigger these red lines and this risk of unacceptable escalation. In response, Pakistan has decided it is actually very much like NATO during the Cold War that Paul Post was talking about, facing a conventionally much larger army Pakistan has forward deployed battlefield nuclear weapons, basically telling the Indians that if they engage in even a limited conventional strike, there's always a chance that something could get out of hand on the battlefield that could trigger nuclear escalation. So this is pushing nukes forward and not espousing a no first use doctrine. So leaving a risk of something going unacceptably wrong that will stop Indian policymakers. So what we see now is a grim, ugly stability, but one in which both actors are trying to kind of manage and manipulate. India trying to escape, and Pakistan trying to kind of fortify the status quo through escalatory nuclear postures that are intertwined with their conventional battlefield forces. And so this, I think, is, is kind of the good news and the bad news. The good news being there's a certain kind of grim, ugly, dangerous, but real stability. The bad news being that strategic actors who want to get around the stability are searching for innovative ways and then facing escalatory countermeasures. Um, there are some other things we can talk about here, Pakistan being seen as prol a proliferation risk, fears of loose nukes and kind of losing control of weapons in the heat of chaos or crisis, and also the emerging India-China competition. But I'll leave it here for now and look forward to questions. Professor Stanilin, thank you so much. And we close out this portion of our conversation with remarks from Paige Price Cohen. Paige. Hey, wonderful. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I am very honored to be here with you tonight as part of such an amazing group. And what I wanted to do is just round out our discussion by talking about my research on inducements and how inducements affect the nuclear reversal process and what that means for the current international security environment. And my research finds that positive inducements are generally more effective than negative inducements at getting leaders to reverse their nuclear weapons programs, to roll back nuclear activity, and even to denuclearize once they've already achieved status as a nuclear weapons state. And for tonight, I'm going to limit my discussion to North Korea, uh, but I'm happy to talk about anything inducement more generally during q um, So I'm sure that for many of you, the situation in North Korea and the tweet storm between President Trump and Kim Jong-un is top of mind. And it certainly is for me, though potentially not for reasons that seem obvious, so for me, it's not the fear that Little Rocket Man is going to irrationally lob a nuclear weapon at the United States or South Korea that keeps me up at night. Rather, for me, the fear comes from United States policy towards North Korea. And to put it simply, if the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, then insanity is an apt description of US sanctions policy towards North Korea. Um, and Professor Pape has said it best. So economic sanctions are generally an ineffective tool when it comes to counterproliferation. And this is particularly true in the case of North Korea uh, for reasons that are both institutional and leader-centric to Kim Jong-un. So institutionally, economic sanctions are ineffective in North Korea 
uh, because Kim Jong-un is not beholden to his population in the same way that the leader of a democracy would be, or even in the way that President Putin is beholden to oligarchs in Russia. So if that's not bad enough, economic sanctions are arguably also inciting Kim Jong-un to more daring nuclear test and shows of strength. So his worst fear is of American interference in North Korea. Um, and a big part of his domestic propaganda, just like his father and his grandfather before him, have been that nuclear weapons are an essential tool to guard against American imperialism. So every time that President Trump tweets about um, increasing economic sanctions or even threatening to use force, he's not only restarting the cycle of interaction between the two countries, but he's actually escalating the tension between them, tweet by tweet. So if economic sanctions and threats of force are ineffective and potentially even counterproductive, then what options does the United States have in regards to North Korea? And my research would suggest that a better option would be positive inducements to offer North Korea concessions. Uh, and this can take a few different forms. It could be lifting previous economic sanctions. It could be offering much needed aid, uh, working with Pyongyang to build a sustainable energy program, or it could even just be changing the rhetoric about North Korea and the international system, um, away from the vile dictatorship that President Trump most recently referred to the regime as. But something to keep in mind with inducements is that it's an incremental process and that denuclearization is most likely not going to be immediately achievable. Uh, so coming to the negotiation table with preconditions of denuclearization might not be the best option, but rather what could happen is the United States could offer North Korea concessions in exchange for the halting of future nuclear tests. And then if both sides comply, and hopefully develop a modicum of trust along the way, maybe at the Winter Olympics, um, <laughs> then perhaps another round of inducements could be offered. But what is clear is that we need a different solution. And for a different solution, we need to take different action. So I'm really excited to talk to you about what that might be and to hear your thoughts on it. And with that, I'll thank you. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much. So there's so much to pick up on here. Um, I'm, I'm torn to ask follow-ups just on the North Korean situation because it's so present, but I think what, what I might do instead is to pull the lens back and start with this macro question and then work down as we come to you with more specific questions about our present moment. And that is, um, I think, Professor Pape, you made quite clear that, that, that you made a strong argument for the way in which the existence of nuclear weapons is actually created a balance of power and a dynamic that has led to uh, a safer last 75 years in, in large measure. But for the rest of you, this question that's before us, the title of this event, uh, is this a safer or more dangerous world because of nuclear weapons? What would the rest of you say in regards to that? And uh, anybody can jump in. I want this to be free flowing. Mm -hmm. Are we safer, are we better off, or are we in a more dangerous place? Well, I think uh, Professor Carson thinks that, uh, you know, right Professor Paper is wrong. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I think you think that we are like, hey, nukes for everyone, uh, yeah. nukes are stable, Hand them out. pass nukes them out at the door, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone I think, gets one. I think that's the, I think that's, you, you, <laughs> you didn't know. get yours on the way in. <laughs> no, I don't. You'd yeah. survive yeah. <laughs> a free cowboy hat. <laughs> so, um, no, I think there is an argument, so I'll, I'll start. I think there is an argument to be made as, uh, as Professor Pape did, that there has been stability um, brought about by the presence of nuclear weapons, but not the good type of stability, right? This, in some ways, this kind of goes to uh, a question that's perplexed a lot of scholars who study conflict, which is, what is the meaning of peace? Is peace simply the absence of conflict, right? And But that could be for a lot of reasons. That could be because the two sides are US and Canada. Get along great. You know, maybe we tease each other, but we have good amicable relations. Or it could be, in the case of the US and Soviet Union or the great power conflict, that the, both sides are deterring each other and actually are fearful of each other. And so that, in that sense, that would be the type of 
safer world that we would describe. It wouldn't necessarily be a happy world. It would not be necessarily a world that we would find desirable, but it would be one that you would see, as was laid out, less great power conflict, if not the complete absence of it, due to the presence of them. Yeah. Well, and, and Paul Stanilin, I mean, you use the experience of India and Pakistan to talk about a way in which the world is far less stable in the dynamic of, of two nuclear powers. I'm wondering, as we enter an era in which we are dealing with a, more, uh, with a multilateral world and with proliferation of non-state actors, what insight does the India-Pakistan example provide for global affairs more broadly, if any? So I think, just to be clear, I think in, in a sense, South Asia become much more dangerous. In a different sense, though, there have not been the large-scale conventional wars, the, the, you know, the level of interstate conflict that we saw, for instance, in 1971. Thousands of soldiers killed in direct fighting, hundreds of thousands of refugees, even millions uh, out of the 1971 war. Um, but the, the, the downside risk is much larger, right? I think that's how we think about this, right? So it depends on what your probability estimate is that we're all gonna die in a nuclear holocaust, right? And that's, I'm, I'm serious, right? If you believe that you can build strong command and control structures, right, that avoid nuclear accidents, that keep fissile material out of the hands of the wrong kinds of actors, and that are you know, institutionally robust enough to survive unpredictable individual leaders, right? And if you also suggest, believe that you can build fairly robust communication between nuclear powers to limit miscalculations and inadvertent escalation, then never having World War II again sounds pretty appealing, right, per Professor Pape's point. If instead you're what's kind of known as a proliferation pessimist, you worry about organizational accidents, you worry about nukes slipping into the wrong hands, uh, you worry about inadvertent escalation through miscalculation, then I think we're in a much more dangerous world. So it becomes kind of a, a theoretical and empirical question about how you balance these very different kinds of risks that in some ways are not, they're not directly commensurable with each other, right? But they're both part of this kind of calculation of how you come down on this, right? Uh, it's basically how well can you manage these nuclear weapons per Austin's point? And yeah. people have very different answers about how kind of complacent they are about well, it. Well, and, and Bob Pape, you, you made a nod to this, uh, the level of individual actors and the unpredictability of how individual leaders respond in the face of threats, in the face of limited information or misinformation, as the case may be. You know, Professor Carson was talking about, you know, some of the global structures that have inhibited this, but what, what role do the personalities of individual leaders play? So, so I think that if it's really good to have what, what Paul Stanley just called these uh, pessimists, <laughs> because I think it's good for us to be vigilant. And I, but I think it's the fear that I talked about which is really behind that. That's what keeps us alert, alert to looking for those ways. Uh, the individual is a good example of that. So last summer, uh, when President Trump started through tweets to, uh, and other things to do things which looked impulsive and kind of scary, um, this wasn't just uh, impulsive and scary. This led to discussions of maybe we need to constitutional, or well, either constitutionally or not, take away his power to use those nuclear weapons, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, I was on lots of different situations where I'm being asked, well, just what are the limits of, of uh, you know, the Secretary of Defense here and so forth? Well, that's occurring, Steve, because of the fear that we're talking about and just how quickly that occurred. So that wasn't, it didn't take three years. It didn't take a nuclear weapon dropping. That took a tweet. Um, and it's because the fear of nuclear weapons is just so powerful. Um, Hawaii, Hawaii went kind of, you know, and it's because of that mistake, the false alarm, the false false alarm, alarm that occurred, alarm. right? People weren't waiting around to find out if that was a false alarm. It's because they took seriously the power of nuclear weapons. Now, it's unhappy that it's a grim stability. It's not a perfect stability. We may be able, I, I actually kind of like democracy, so I hope over time democracy can make it even a better stable peace over time. <laughs> but I don't think democracy is spreading all around the world in, in a Kantian way by tomorrow or even 10, tomorrow, 10 years tomorrow. So I like the idea that as we're trying to make for a better, more stable world, Nuclear weapons, um, I think, are generally helpful. But it is the case that um, I just would say two cheers for nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Professor Crushing, Austin, you mm -hmm. want to? Well, number one, <clears throat> fear itself is not a guarantee of stability or safety. You can respond to fear in a lot of different ways. So when I think about this question of safer, more dangerous world, I think about the things that have allowed fear to be harnessed for peaceful, mean, for peaceful ends. The other thing is I, I want to think about and point out is that 
the peaceful or the safer or the more dangerous qualities of nuclear weapons, none of that is a product of technology itself. It's a product of what we do with technology. So when I think about the, the safer world that Professor Pape um, is sort of characterizing today, I think about two things that contributed to that strategic stability. Um, one of them is this idea that deterrence, mutually assured destruction between two countries, has to be learned. It has to be figured out. The miscalculation happens when you don't know or understand the military maneuvers the other side is using. You interpret it as an attempt to take out a nuclear facility, and since you don't have any communication lines with them, you just take it to the next level, right? So what uh, Professor Stanilin said I completely agree with, which is that the South Asian context uh, underscores the degree to which stable deterrence was the product of years, decades of development of a stable deterrence posture between the US and Soviet Union during the Cold War and then had to be replicated and is still in the process of being developed and replicated for India and Pakistan. The other thing that has gone hand in hand with the strategic stability that, that nuclear weapons can provide is what I talked about, the global nonproliferation regime. The bottling those weapons up within a finite number of countries keeps the number of crises in which they are <coughs> invoked uh, to a reasonable number. It keeps the number of dyads that have to develop this learned method of deterrence at a manageable level. And so while I do think it is a kind of nuclear apartheid, it's something deeply unfair about that system. It is a precondition or a facilitating condition for that sort of safer world uh, outcome. But as a quick follow-up for you, for anybody yeah. else, I mean, you referenced at the beginning of your remarks this notion of the genie being out of the bottle. Isn't it inevitable that we're just going to get expansive, unlimited proliferation over time, a technology that exists, et cetera. What, what's your sense of that, Dr. Cohn? Oh, certainly. Um, I mean, we, we've, got, we've got nine nuclear powers now, right? Exactly. And so, so is it just a matter of time before there's a 10th and 11th and another rogue actor and, <laughs> and, and it fall, the technology falls into the hands of yet another state? I think you can see it both ways. But I don't think it's just a matter of time. Or 11 so, countries, I should say, right? Yeah. Right. So there are nine currently, nine states that currently have nuclear and weapons. And we were successful in reversing 11, yeah. So we have known the technology for how to build a nuclear weapon for a very long period of time. Um, a PhD physicist student actually did this as his PhD project to get everything that he could publicly on how to build a nuclear weapon. Um, and was able to find all of the technology needed. So if it was just a matter of knowing the technology exists will beget you proliferation, then I think that shows you that there's a problem there. So we've known that since the 1970s. Um, but I think this brings up a really good point because we've kind of touched on this idea that nuclear weapons creates a world between the haves and the have-nots. And I do think that that partly leads to a more dangerous world. So I can try and play devil's advocate here just a little bit. Um, and I do want to give a nod to the Bulletin, who, as you mentioned, for the first time since 1953, put the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes. And this is not something that they did on a whim. Um, it's certainly something that they thought through very carefully. And so the reasons that they believe that the world is more dangerous uh, than it was last year and than it was 70 years ago uh, is a lot to do with how Tr President Trump is responding to North Korea, how he's responding to the JCPOA with Iran, um, interactions between the United States and Russia, uh, and then the nuclear posture review. But part of this is also the, the public and that we have less belief in institutions. And I think this is a huge part of why people are fearing or feeling more fearful. Sorry. Well, and that's a perfect segue to your comments in your work, Professor Post. What about that idea? I mean, Trump himself as a candidate and early in his presidency questioned the validity of NATO to a large degree, right? So, so where are we with this, the erosion of institutions? No, I think this is, it, it's, <laughs> I was saying the other day that I study the one constant, I mentioned about how NATO and nuclear weapons are the two constants of international politics, but the one constant of American politics since 1949 is complaining about NATO. <laughs> <laughs> every president, every, every secretary of state, every secretary of defense has complained about NATO. We're spending, they're not spending enough, but part of that is 
why haven't we pulled out of NATO then? You know, if we're always complaining about it, and even someone like Trump's like, what's the point? Well, eventually they recognized that NATO is more than just actually defense expenditures. That, as I was talking about, that it's the, once you put, once you bring nuclear weapons into that context, you realize that it's it's much it's much different. You realize NATO is so much more valuable. But it's valuable in ways that aren't necessarily happy ways, right? I mean, part of this t touches on what uh, uh, Professor uh, or uh, Dr. Cohn was just saying, which is that NATO institutionalizes haves and have-nots, right? That the whole purpose of it is to say, you're not going to have weapons. But that's okay, because we're going to have the weapons. We're We've use, got your back. We've got your back. Trust us on this. And that's why that yeah. Article 5 is so important, to be able to say that, yes, we're going to defend you. Um, but it institutionalizes the haves and the have-nots. Um, and it does so because the I have your back is not the threat of a small state acquiring the weapon. It's the threat of the two major powers. It's the threat posed by and still perceived threat posed by Russia. And this in many ways goes back to the point that um, Dr. Cohn was raising about how there's been very few states who have actually acquired nuclear weapons. But the ones who have them, they're the ones who really pose the bigger threat. And indeed, that's the reason that the atomic bulletin has moved the clock. It isn't because of the threat of proliferation. It's the threat posed by those who already have the weapons. And NATO is just one of the institutional arrangements that's been made to try to manage that. The other one, of course, being the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Well, just to pick up on that, from your perspective, um, Austin Carson, you, you talked earlier about um, we were talking earlier as a group about misinformation, mm -hmm. and you've, yeah. you've done a lot of work looking at secrecy and transparency, and it, w certainly we can all recognize the risks of not having access to information. You've advocated for much, much greater transparency in the international order when it comes to actually sharing information around nuclear proliferation um, and nuclear technology. Um, what is the trade-off there, and, and why is that such a significant piece of this that's missing from the dynamic currently? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I actually have, I'm of two minds of the issue and, and have, a, um, have done some research on ways in which um, the more information can be worse sometimes, mm. um, which uh, we found some historical episodes where basically countries were worried that if, if they, you know, if, if countries in the Middle East in the late 60s, early 70s knew quite how sophisticated the Israeli nuclear arsenal was at that time, that there would be a real sort of rush for the exits to, to go get their own weapons. And so there was a strategic choice by the United States at that time to perpetuate, or well, to initiate and then maintain along with Israel a kind of strategic ambiguity about what Israel's nuclear capabilities were. So there, there is a sort of downside. Um, but in the work that, that I've been, uh, been doing on the IAEA, the, the real trade-off that, that we have found is that uh, on the one hand, governments are unwilling because of issues, concerns about sovereignty and control over their physical space and the information that you can derive from that. There's an unwillingness to give some other actor the authority to go verify whether or not you are proliferating or not. Or if we ever got to the world where we did do disarmament, to verify whether or not a country that had nuclear weapons had actually reversed and gotten rid of them. So on the one hand, they won't let somebody else do it. And then <clears throat> sharing information that they might have about other governments uh, deceiving or, or, or using secrecy to evade detection. It's very difficult um, to, to release that information because as our work has focused on, that makes it harder to collect that kind of information from other targets two years down the road, three years down the road, five years down the road. So um, there are things that have been um, uh, institutional solutions that have been experimented with where the IAEA can receive a private briefing, for example, from the French or from the Germans or from the US um, that involves some intelligence and then acts on that information. They don't tell everyone what they know and who they got it from, but they go investigate it. That's one way we found that they're trying to cope with this tension, but it's a tension that's somewhat unavoidable. And so I think you're always gonna be operating within a sort of imperfect uh, uncertainty type uh, climate, uh, whether you're thinking about proliferation and non-proliferation, or if we get more into it, this idea of disarmament or abolition, which I think is a really difficult uh, aspect of that problem as well. Yeah, tell, tell us more about, we, we haven't had as much talk of disarmament or abolition in recent years in the post-Cold War environment. Um, wh wh why not and what are the prospects for that as you see it, Austin Carson? I think, hmm, 
Well, in some ways, there has been more. There has been quite a bit of discussion. There's the Global Zero campaign. There's a nuclear a nuclear ban treaty that's been um, negotiated, and and politically, those those uh, initiatives aren't going to go anywhere until the states that have nuclear arsenals and have had them for decades get behind it. And of course, uh, President Obama received a sort of premature Nobel Peace Prize for his <laughs> uh, commitment to disarmament, and that that got us uh, a real fire on that front. So, uh, you know. I think the underlying reason is, or at least my underlying skepticism of the, of the proposal, in spirit, in my heart, I want to be an abolitionist. I want to see disarmament someday. Um, but in, in practice, I think you really have to wrestle with this, with this issue of how do you deal with the bomb in the basement? Um, or even if there isn't a bomb in the basement, how do you deal with a team of, of engineers and uh, research scientists that can, um, over the course of six months or a year, in a dedicated uh, crash program redevelop that technology, even if you somehow politically got over the hurdle of getting everybody to commit to it. So if people want to talk about it more, uh, I'd be happy to engage it. But that's the, that's the thing, the sticking point for me is, is to verify disarmament or abolition is just uh, a real difficult nut to crack. And you really have to confront it if you, if you want to have a position on it. What the rest of you think yeah. about that? So I really worry about going too low. And I know that going too high is bad. So I first want to say that one of the reasons I think we don't have a whole lot of proliferation is because we're not in an era of a nuclear arms race over the last 30 years. The era of proliferation, where we went from one to eight, the numbers, was an era of actual arms racing. And so as the arms race occurred, it tended to feed on itself. And then since the end of the Cold War, we've been going the other way. And that's tend to be a, a general positive. So I'm not making the case that, uh, but at the same time, to try to really go super low, that's when you can start to um, design these super slick strategies that Paul Stanlan was talking about, about how to actually knock out the other side's nuclear weapons. So if the other side's really only got 10, and uh, this is the India-Pakistan situation. If they really have these teeny tiny numbers, that's actually probably the most dangerous of all. Better to have 100 or 200 than to have 10. So it's either zero or, or that. Because once you're down to 10, then you're going to get a bunch of smart folks like at the University of Chicago to say, <laughs> bad. <laughs> and how can I take out that other guy's 10? And they're going to fool themselves into thinking they can. I actually think they'll be wrong, but they'll think they can do it. Yeah, I think this is absolutely right. I think if you're going to have nuclear weapons, you want survivable arsenals. That is to say, arsenals that you believe cannot be taken out in a splendid first strike by an adversary. Because if you're in a world where you think you have to use them or you're going to lose them, that's a very dangerous world. And when you start thinking about preemptive use, this is one of the things people worry about with North Korea, that Kim Jong-un thinks we're coming for him for regime change. And there's a window. It's a small one. It's a low probability one, but a window where it might become rational to think about nuclear use. Um, and so in some sense, in the, in the India-Pakistan context, the nuclear arms race that occurred there has in some ways been good because we're, it's now really hard to imagine a brilliant strategy that will kind of knock everything out, right? Um, there are people who have made the argument, um, Daryl Press and Keir Lieber, that the US, if it got really lucky and really good, could actually go after Chinese nuclear nuclear facilities, right? So once you start thinking about real counterforce targeting, that is to say going after, believing you can kind of engage in a first strike to take out nuclear weapons and remove MAD, I think that's when you're in an incredibly dangerous world. So I completely agree with everything Bob said. If you've got them, you want medium-sized arsenals that are survivable. Yeah, and I should clarify my premise earlier. We've certainly had a lot of conversation about de-escalation since the, the, the Cold War and throughout the later phases of it. Not as much public conversation in the most recent years in terms of, of a foreign policy debate in the public level. But let, let me come actually to you, Paige Price Cohen. You were talking about positive inducements. And then we're going to go to questions from you. Um, you know, one of the rejoinders that you could anticipate when we talk about positive inducements would be, isn't that just rewarding bad behavior? So what's your response to that argument? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I wanted to take a quick second Please. to tie this back in to what Bob was saying earlier. Um, so Professor Papes said that you know, proliferation really ended with the Cold War. That's true, but there have been a lot of attempts after the Cold War. And this is why I think positive inducements are so effective because there have been at least 10 to 12 other states that attempted to build nuclear weapons programs after the Cold War. Um, and I love that argument. I love the argument that, okay, positive inducement, so you're just rewarding bad behavior. And I think you need to look at it as 
what is the actual goal? So the United States sees itself as this watchdog, and they, in previous policy, have not wanted to be seen, just like you said, to reward bad behavior. Um, and in the 2000s, when the Bush administration came into power, that's one of the reasons why talks with North Korea fell through, uh, because President Bush did not, did not want to be seen, like President Clinton, to be rewarding bad behavior, uh, and basically came up with a policy that was anything but Clinton. But I think the question becomes, is your ultimate goal to prevent proliferation, or is your ultimate goal to not be seen to reward bad behavior? Uh, because of the 35 states that have attempted to gain um, access to nuclear weapons, to proliferate, to build nuclear weapons programs, the majority of those states have actually reversed because of positive inducements and not negative inducements. So let's take your <laughs> questions. We have a couple of microphones, one um, on that side, I believe. We'll bring a microphone around to you, and we've got one on this side. So go ahead and put up your hands, and we'll get a microphone over to you. Uh, we'll start there all the way in the back, and then uh, we'll go over here, and we'll work our way forward. So yes, um, your question for our group. Hi. Um, so in the post-9-11, pre-Trump world, there was a lot of focus on the threat from non-state actors. And I'm wondering if you can speak to whether that, ch that threat has actually changed or if our focus has changed. Um, who, who wants to take that? Okay, yeah. okay. Austin and then, I'll and then take one crack. Yeah. I'm a reformed alarmist. So <laughs> in my previous life, before I went to graduate school, I <clears throat> actually worked in, at a think tank in Washington, and, and we received funding for a project which was supposed to scare the hell out of Europe to try to get Europeans to fund uh, nuclear security measures due to the risk of nuclear terrorism. So I participated in the creation of a simulation in which a nuclear weapon was detonated by a terrorist organization in a major European capital. <clears throat> and having gone through that experience, um, my own personal view, uh, having sort of looked at all of this and, and really thought about the probabilities of someone <clears throat> taking a, diverting a constructed weapon or developing it on their own, my personal opinion is it is a very, very low possibility of happening. So non-state actors in terms of uh, an insurgent group or a coup that might happen in Pakistan is another matter. But um, specifically uh, in terms of nuclear terrorism, I'm actually quite relieved that the rhetoric about you know, a mushroom cloud uh, because of a sort of nine, a nuclear 9-11, to me that seemed to just sort of not take into account the complexity of um, the engineering required to make a functioning fission, or let alone fusion weapon, and the practicalities of getting that somewhere and detonating it. It's not, it's not a big red button that if you just take the button and take the weapon, you're good to go. <laughs> All right, so um, Paul and Bob, yeah. And another aspect to it is, and it kind of builds on this, about how complex it is to actually detonate one of these, is also a lot of times these non-state actors really don't even know what they're dealing with. Um, when I was working on my book for the economics of war, one of the aspects of economics I looked at was the black market for nuclear material. And it turned out like the CIA did all sorts of sting operations, especially in Eastern Europe following the Cold War. And what they found was a lot of times, you know, you'd be in Prague, go to this back alley, there'd be this guy and say, hey, you know, I've got fizzle material. And they'd open it up and feel like, this is not what this, this is not fizzle, this is not going to work. Or it might actually be fizzle material, but it's in such a state of disrepair because they didn't know how to handle it, kind of going back to uh, Professor Carson's point. So, you know, they would arrest the guy, of course, you know, because he's trying to proliferate. <laughs> I think that just highlights another reason why this became less of a concern, was just this was another aspect of where it's just very difficult for non-state actors to actually handle these materials. Bob Pape, this is your wheelhouse. What's yeah, your well, just, they, they're both right. <laughs> I would just add two points. Number one, um, it's almost never going to be in the interest of any state that's got a nuclear weapon to give it to a non-state actor for fear that they're going to turn around and just nuke them right back. Um, and that's why the idea that Saddam Hussein was going to go handing these off to folks, even if he got them, which he didn't. Um, but the more important point I want to make that's a little different here is a failed state. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've been forgetting about is for 30 years we've been predicting North Korea is going to be a failed state. We've been putting economic sanctions on them to try to make them become a failed state. Well now they've got 30 to 60 nuclear weapons. Do we really want 
Pyongyang to collapse as an entity so that those 30 to 60 weapons now are floating free through first through North Korea and then God knows where they're going to be because it's no, now going to be this really uh, dangerous situation where we don't know. So I'm extremely concerned about these policies that look at first blush like uh, we should be tough on those actors for fear that we might get our wish. Yeah, we might actually break North Korea in pieces and then discover that we can't occupy it fast enough to get all 60 of those weapons. Yeah. Let's go to this side. We have a question back? Yeah. Uh, so my question is that with, for instance, Israel being able to keep their uh, nuclear program uh, secret and under wraps for quite a long time, Officially, as far as I know, there's no, no country has a comprehensive um, anti-nuclear weapon defense system like uh, the SDI in the 80s. What do you think the chances that a, a program like that is possessed by one of the uh, nuclear powers and is being kept under wraps? And if so, what do you think the effect of that could be? Um, so I'll just, uh, so I think that it is a possibility that we may discover a way to shoot down a nuclear weapon. And we're trying very hard. The United States in particular has put its foot down uh, for now about 20 years in trying to do just that. It's not impossible. The, but the problem that we face is that the other side that's trying to get a nuclear weapon that, that we would try to shoot down has an enormous advantage. So it's not like they need to match us dollar for dollar. There are so many ways to slip a nuclear weapon in if, North, say, North Korea really wanted to. And I don't want to scare you, <laughs> but, but the truth is um, they don't need a missile. You know, there's a whole lot of shipping containers that we never look at. Um, they don't need to respond this week or this month or even this year to a provocation, they can, perfect, they can retaliate two, three years down the road. So the whole idea of making the uh, dome, so to speak, a perfectly invulnerable, uh, I think that this misleads the public into thinking that this would really be a perfectly safe situation. I just don't believe, I think it's gonna be very difficult to do, and even if we did, it's not gonna stop all those other ways. And the only other thing that I would add to that is, is keep in mind that with nuclear weapons, even if you have a missile defense shield, what's terrible about nuclear weapons is it just takes one, right? So you might stop 10, you might stop 20, but it just takes one to be able to get through. It just takes one missed strike. And that's one of the fears about any time the military is playing, oh, well, we could take this out, we could take, and they may be right. And they might say, you know, we'll be 95% correct. <coughs> you know, it'll work 95%. <laughs> but the problem is that 5%, you just need one. Yes. And especially in a situation like the Korean Peninsula, where just one getting through could be devastating. Let's take another question on this so we have a hand all the way in the back and happy to bring the microphone toward the front if folks have questions on this side. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, in a sense, ask the same question but from the opposite angle. Uh, there are those who argue that missile defense systems uh, not only are imperfect but actually greatly uh, raise the possibility of, of catastrophe by making nuclear powers more confident and, and you know, sort of removing the specter of mutually assured destruction. So what do you think of that view of missile defense systems? Who wants that, Paul? Well, yeah. I, I think it, it's conceivable that that would be the case. I mean, in my knowledge, there are no powers that are actually highly confident, right? So you could worry about a moral hazard in which an actor says, I have a perfect shield. I'm invulnerable, therefore I can act in whatever I want, and you get yourself into a war. I think everybody at this point knows that this is an extremely imperfect tool, right? And so the, the issues that Bob and Paul Post were raising, I think, are still very present. Um, there's just no perfect defense to this, right? And that even a low probability of a catastrophic event, I think, has really reduced the moral hazard associated with these kinds of um, anti-ballistic missile systems. And by the way, just uh, as, a, as a quick sidebar, um, the Goodman Theater is currently <laughs> staging Blind Date, a world premiere play that is set in the 1985 December meeting, the first summit between Reagan and Gorbachev. Um, and it is a fascinating, in some cases, 
uh, fictional account of this, but SDI figures quite prominently as do, does diplomacy. <laughs> so if you're interested in a dramatic interpretation of uh, these origin stories, that would be an opportunity for you to do so. We'll take a hand here, and we'll go back there. Yes, uh, question on uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, last year, towards the end of the year, uh, put the sole survivor clause into their bylaws that in the event of some nuclear attack that the remaining board member could take action on behalf of the entire board without legal liability. I, and as I understand, that's language from the 1950s that yeah. just suddenly reappeared. Any thoughts or comments on that? <laughs> well, well, I think what it shows is, again, you're seeing since the Trump administration has come into office, and it's not literally just since then, but um, candidate Trump was also talking quite cavalierly about nuclear weapons, uh, publicly saying, well, why can't we use them, and things like that. Um, and I think what that's done is it's triggered in the public um, fear, even among people that just don't know that much about the details of nuclear weapons. Um, they know that they were bad, and that's good enough. Um, and so I think, sir, what you're seeing is some of those pressures coming in, that as the public is becoming afraid, that actually is a dampening effect on the negative thing happening. Is it perfect? No. But I think that's really what you're seeing is fear. Other hands? We have a hand over here, and then we have several on this side, um, back here. So we can bring one up to this corner, and then we've got two here. So my question concerns what you all think about the dangers of sort of increased time having passed since the Cold War and public, as well as um, governmental ignorance of kind of the effects of nuclear weapons and or, you know, the distance from the duck and cover era, which gets at the, the point that was just made, sort of that people who don't really know about nuclear weapons are now not only coming of age, but as we see with um, the president coming into office in certain areas. So, so I read that that was also part of the rationale for moving the hands forward, and I was just wondering what you all thought about that, like the the degradation of knowledge as a as an increase in the danger. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, who wants to take that? Anyone? Yeah, I'll you want to take yeah. um, No, I think that's a great point, and I would first say that I think it's great that everyone is here. Right? Like, I think this is a huge thing. Part of this is people are more interested in the Kardashians than they are in this, and so the fact that we're having an intelligent discussion about what nuclear weapons mean in this current era is wonderful. Um, because I do think it's a huge problem, and I think it's a huge problem that the public perception and the public trust in institutions is declining, and it has rapidly declined since President Trump t came to office. And I would agree with you that that's one of the reasons that the bulletin um, set the hands of the clock back. Yes, Paul? I'll play devil's advocate a little bit here. Okay, so Donald Trump is not a, a spring chicken, right? He was around during the Cold War, right? He <laughs> did duck and cover. He lived in New York City, which would be wiped out, you know, like that when, when the balloon went up. So, like, he doesn't even have that excuse, right? Um, <laughs> so I think, I, I think, you know, this is, there's an interesting question here, right? Which is, at the mass level, maybe we don't know as much as we used to about nuclear weapons, though I would not over-exaggerate how much people actually understood about, you know, throw weights and, you know, kill packages and stuff during the Cold War. Um, I think that the more interesting question, in a sense, is the elite level, right? Is, has there been continuity in the kind of expertise and institutional capacity to maintain a secure arsenal, right? One that is competent and effective and can do the things we want it to do and, above all, not do the things we don't want it to do, right? Um, I haven't seen evidence of a major degradation in that, but there are these news reports that pop up about unfortunate accidents and people being fired for incompetence. And so when we think about institutions, right, there are a lot of institutions we could think of. I think those that keep our nuclear weapons from accidentally being shot off into space are like number one institution to be paying attention to. Um, and so in an era where you know, bureaucracy, professionalism, expertise are often criticized as kind of the luxury of effete elites, um, I hope we'll keep in mind nuclear weapons as maybe being an exception to that dismissal. Let's go to Bob and then Austin. You want um, to so a friend of mine at Notre Dame, Mike Desch, um, did a very fascinating <coughs> study 
He um, got 500 people who had Senate confirmation for being in uh, national security positions, State Department, Defense Department, et cetera, and asked them a very simple set of questions. What was the most important thing you learned at university? And the number one thing, 80% of them, they all scattered on a bunch of little things, but 80% of them said nuclear deterrence theory. <laughs> now, I'll take our classes, <laughs> okay? Dean Woodward, support us, <laughs> okay? But that's really striking. 80% said that was the number one thing they got out of college. That's pretty important because that speaks to what we're talking about. Yes, there's general worries about degradation, but the fact of the matter is the place where this is kept is in universities because we're the folks who do a lot of the education of future leaders. Yeah, that's a great point. Let's take um, two last questions. Oh yeah, Austin, I forgot. Just two quick points, yes, sorry. Please, please. First, there's a fine line between healthy alarm and alarmism. So I'm not sure we want to go back to the early 50s, mm -hmm. you know, sort of duck and cover under your desk and you'll be okay, no <laughs> Defenses fallout. on the lakefronts of Chicago. <laughs> exactly, right. right. So, so I th that, you know, just keep that in perspective. And then secondly, the thing that does actually really worry me is some, um, some research that's come out in the last five, 10 years uh, that's indicated a weakening of the norm against nuclear use uh, in the mass public. That is asking people the Amer in the American public, is it okay under certain scenarios for us to use a nuclear weapon against North Korea? And a really, truly disturbing number of people saying, yeah, that, that's okay. I mean, they killed 20,000 of our soldiers, so yeah, we can go ahead and nuke them. So if, if there's one thing I hope isn't eroding, is it's a healthy understanding of what exactly the consequences of using nuclear weapons are, because that, is, is, um, that has not changed and is really important given that we have the arsenal and can choose to use it. Okay, let's take one last one on this side, if we can. Yeah, come right to you. I'm an unreformed alarmist, so I need some help. <laughs> the thing about North Korea, when we developed a nuclear bomb, it took a huge economy. 10% of our electricity was used for it. Now a poor country like North Korea can have a nuclear weapon, getting from all these other different sources. It become much cheaper, much less expensive to get it. Can you talk a little bit about why North Korea was able to get it, and we shouldn't be afraid everybody else is able to get it? It's one part of it. The second part of the question is fear is a motivating factor. But if Kim Jong-un is afraid for his regime and himself, won't that motivate him to drop the bomb? So just a real quick point to put your, a very good question in context. North Korea's economy last year is estimated at $20 billion. Chicago economy last year was $600 billion. Mm -hmm. South Korea's economy last year was $2 trillion. Just to put this, your point, in sharp relief. So, and why is North Korea able to do that? Because they're one of the most vulnerable states on the planet. Um, for decades, year after year, the uh, United States and South Korea, who have many, many times the size of the GNP and technological advantage, we practice exercises, and we're about to do this again in March, that's why I'd like to stop that, um, <laughs> um, where we are going to conquer every inch of uh, North Korea. Um, and we're going to tell the Chinese, just make sure you stay out for another couple weeks because we've got two more, uh, you know, two more acres to go. So that, over decades and decades, can get a, a, even the 204th poorest country on the planet to put the resources in to develop a nuclear weapon. We just simply have to stop conquering countries <laughs> willy-nilly at our display. It's just not a good idea. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me close just by asking one question of all of you and have you go down, um, if we could. And Bob, we, we'll start with you and we can come back uh, all the way down toward my end. And that is, if you were to advise uh, the U.S. government, regardless of administration, on the top two priorities to keep in mind for uh, our own nuclear security and global nuclear, secu nuclear security, what would it be? What are the two things you would uh, The number suggest? one thing would be the health of the North Korean economy. So I really worry about the health of the North Korean economy. I like the, I think Paige and I have a deal. I don't know if we can get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've got the, so, the, the, real, outlines, so yeah. the real answer that I would give to your question about why uh, isn't it just rewarding bad behavior? Uh, no, I want to support them from becoming a failed state. Yeah. So number one is the health of the North Korean economy. Um, and number two is um, not to abandon the nuclear deal with Iran without a better deal already in place. Mm -hmm.
Paul Post. So first and foremost would be the main thing I would want to do for any president or administration, which is to help them understand the value of NATO, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> that it's essential. It's not a relic of the Cold War. It's essential for maintaining Europe as not becoming a state that proliferate. And indeed, a lot of those states who gave up their nuclear weapons following the Cold War were indeed these states who, some of whom came into NATO. Um, so that would be number one, is NATO's essential, it's not a relic of the Cold War, and it's not about how much money the Europeans spend. It's about creating incentives to, for nuclear stability. Um, number two is, yeah, I would agree that there's, <laughs> there's a need to rethink. I really want to go back and emphasize what Dr. Uh, Cohn said, which is that you know insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, right? And I think that we've seen that whether it's invasion as the ultimate form of negative inducement, <laughs> right, to sanctions, that this is not an effective policy for preventing proliferation. And so I think that just to more generalize from your North Korea point is this idea of you know really using offering goodies. NATO being one example of that, but offering goodies as a way of preventing proliferation. I think that's the main policy. Austin Carson. <clears throat> Number one, I would um, recommend that we redouble our support for the International Atomic Energy Agency and find creative ways to allow that actor to um, do the heavy lifting, to figure out what's going on when a country is suspected of developing technology and make sure that nuclear weapons technology stays in a relatively finite number of hands where we might someday think about doing something more with it. Uh, number two, and this is gonna sound maybe a little bit weird, but when I think about uh, the Trump administration and these scenarios about a war with North Korea, um, I would recommend to each individual person in the bureaucracy to remember that there are noble forms of bureaucratic disobedience. If President Trump orders uh, any, any kind of limited strike, um, or let alone a nuclear strike against North Korea, um, a bunch of human beings have to implement that order, and they need to be ready to push back using any professional means necessary uh, to advise against that and not implement it if, if they think it truly is uh, a disastrous decision. And I think that's the one thing that gives me a little bit of peace of mind, is I think there are many ways for bureaucratic disobedience if we get in that situation. Paul Stanley. So uh, I agree with all of this. I'll, I'll add two different ones. Um, one, we haven't talked much about China and the rise of China, yes. but you know, the big challenge over the next 50 years is going to be the Western Pacific, the rise of China. So I want to think about, I think we need to think really hard about ways of building robust conventional deterrence in the Western Pacific, supporting allies as we choose, building credible deterrent postures that reduce as much as possible prospects of inadvertent nuclear escalation. Right? So you worry about what happens when you get a Taiwan contingency or you know, some other limited war in East Asia. What are the pathways of nuclear escalation and how do we try to limit those as much as possible? Um, the second, which is in you know, my wheelhouse, is thinking about the problem of basically Pakistani loose nuclear weapons. Right? I don't think this is as big a problem as some people have said, but it's not a trivial one, especially when you get battlefield deployment of tactical nuclear weapons. You get into a crisis, things start to get crazy, everybody starts to get crazy. In war, you know, plans never survive first contact. You worry about radical actors taking advantage of crisis situations to grab a, a now deployed nuclear weapon and kind of running off with it, right? I think that's the one scenario in which I worry about non-state actors and, and nuclear weapons. Paige Prashko. Awesome. Um, so I'm echoing in a lot of ways. But firstly, I would say we need to maintain alliances. So extended deterrence or our nuclear security umbrella is a number one inducement that the United States has. Uh, but alliances aren't static. And South Korea actually sought nuclear weapons even after they were under our umbrella because we didn't have a credible commitment to them. So I think we need to keep that in mind now and make sure that our commitments are credible to our alliances, just like Paula said. Um, and then I'm going to echo not abandoning the JCPOA. I think this is incredibly important for a lot of reasons, but a big one is the perception that it gives to other countries and to potential new proliferators like Saudi Arabia. Paige Price Cohn, Paul Stanilin, Austin Carson, Paul Post, Bob Pape, thank you all so much for a timely and insightful conversation. We gained a lot from it and appreciate you convening all of us for it. My thanks also to the Division of Social Sciences, to the Chicago Project on Security and Threats, and the Institute of Politics. Thank you all so much for being here. We look forward to continuing the conversation as we close out today. Please give the panelists a warm round of applause.
Thank you, Steve. Thank yes, you very thank much, you. Steve. Thank you.